It's 335. Custa has graciously joined us today. We're here to talk about some OWCS. We're here to talk about the meta. We're doing all kinds of things. Custa, how you doing? How are things? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's good to have some form of Overwatch esports back. Uh, OWCS has been fun so far. Uh, like, obviously, it's not the Overwatch League, and we're definitely not, uh, we're not living the dream, but it's been fun nonetheless. <laughs> it, it does seem it is nice to have back it's nice to have something to watch and something to kind of break down and digest Yiska, yep. how much have you watched um i caught a couple of uh, uh player streams i watched okay, a ton okay. of funny astra I, I think a oh, ton is, is a lie like three hours i think in to total um it's also like it's definitely a little bit more challenging to keep up with everything there's sure. still to my knowledge yeah. there's not a schedule broadcast schedule when everything is happening um, I assume they will have to make a selection, which which games have to be broadcast. That has not been communicated yet. I don't even think players ne or teams necessarily know when they will play yet. Mm, um, okay. So mm. I, I feel like that's really like like okay. The rough time outlines have been communicated. By the way, they, are, they seem super rough for the West Coast. I think they started one p.m. If I'm not mistaken. Mm. Yeah. Um, so good luck doing that if you have a job or, um, you know, you're in university and have classes, but yeah, overall, like, I feel like the communication around this is a little bit lackluster in terms of being able to keep up with it. And, um, I don't, it's not even necessarily that the information is hidden. It's just not out there. Now that's concerning. Is that something that you kind of, obviously... Working through the the, the Swiss stage, um, is that something that you guys kind of like felt at all, Costa? Um, I think the Swiss stage was the thing that was the most clear because okay. it was like that's the first round, right? They're sure, like, sure, hey, sure, there's sure, gonna sure. be nine rounds. His thing, but I agree with Yiska. It's like if we had qualified, I would have been like, well, now what, right? Like, I don't, right. I still don't even know what you know. As someone who is co-streaming the event, uh how long the window of games are going to be played. As you just said, there's a lot of games and they'll be played simultaneously. How many rounds are there going to be played? Um, how much time am I going to have to stream? Are sure. these going to be broadcast? All those kind of things. So like the information might be out there if you go digging and I'm sure behind the scenes you could find it, but publicly to the fans, it feels like it could be difficult for people to just know what's going on, uh, which I think it can be a problem. I, I I ask because, I mean, far be it for me to say that teams are not informed based on the information that they definitely have, but which team reads? <laughs> we know from Overwatch League that basically nobody True. does. Yeah. But yep. um, on an email. I, I saw plenty of uh, even people that made group stage uh, ask whether, like, when, when stuff is starting up. There's, in the rule set, it basically says the time. But th there's five days where the first round will take place. You will only have to play three matches. So you don't necessarily know when, when your first game is. And I strongly assume, considering you cannot stream all of the matches, that the broadcast will be picking and selecting which time slots you want. So they, they are shuffling it around. Which is also, by the way, I think the real difference in structure to, um, to the Swiss stage. Because from my understanding, mm. it was all bots, right? Like, you, you had, like, bots in your lobby that created everything, yeah. right, for you. And, by the way, this disrupts the, the organization in another way, which is n now this time it's not set up by bots. It's presumably done by admins. And therefore, it's less likely that we also will get the stats. I actually quite liked it on the Faceit page. You had access to a bunch of stuff yeah. by the API. I don't think that will be possible for the group stage. And that is presumably because real people will be, um, you know, scheduling everything and trying to get everyone to a lobby, and therefore it's no, there's no automatic stats tracking on the uh, on those lobbies. So I personally assumed that the broadcast will just be asking for games based on their, you know, best knowledge on what games could be interesting in these first rounds. Um, I, I will say something on my end because I signed up for the co-streaming thing. There is like a uh, sign-up thing, and then they wanted to get you to get into the um, face it like th website so you can get a clean feed. So I would assume right. that broadcast would hopefully be doing something similar to that. But then it's like, well, they probably want to have their OBS team in there so they can schedule that. So I agree, there could just be like 
if they have to start doing it manually, that could cause a huge conk in, uh, um, like slowdown of the system because the thing that makes face it so great and the Swiss stage show great is it was very seamless. Other than that one team that went to like map four, at least in North America, that went to like map four, all three rounds of every yeah. single map. So their match took like two hours compared to everyone else's one hour. It was pretty seamless for the most part. It's good. Sounds like the the new systems are all pretty streamlined and integrating well. It's just, you know, as we get deeper into 2024, gonna hide in an, in a weird very echoey way kind of having to rebuild the ship as it as it goes and maybe it's not as as bleak as it seems we will see um but we're going to talk a little bit about the meta we're going to have i i do have some questions for custer regarding some concerns coming out of korea you know i'm seeing a whole lot of 3-0 i know yiska loves a great 3-0 is this maybe a problem an inherent problem of opening up to more of a a grassroots scene excited to to kind of get that explored I, a little bit i don't know i i think three o's are very common yes. in mm -hmm. any type of uh type of open circuit right which is yeah. the way it's going to be right uh it's important to remember even in korea as much as some of these rosters are stacked this is still the group stage for just the korean region right then we're going to go to asian region but like the i think the issue that this asia region is going to have is if it's a stomp in the Korean group region, like it's going to be more of a stomp in the Asian yes, region yeah. where the three Korean teams end up facing against, was it the uh, three Japanese teams and the two mm -hmm. um, Pacific teams? Because those rosters are cool and they're fun to watch in their own right. They're nowhere near as good as the top three of Korea. Oh. Like top three of Korea is probably top three of the world, close to. There may be a European team that could fight it, a North American team that could fight it, but for the most part, they're going to just dominate over the region. Yes. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of 3-0s. That's what happens when you have an open circuit. And I think for now, the important thing that needs to sort of be like portrayed is like, this isn't a competitive part of the tournament. This right. is a, hey, let's see who can qualify. Everyone can play with their friends. But like, if you watched in North America, any of the Toronto Defiant matches, I'm pretty sure they 2-0 swept spawn camp, like yep. every single team. Like even the last team to go 9-0. Like that's just going to be how it is uh in swiss formats i will say and then i don't think even think it's necessarily only a thing of uh of open formats it's a thing mm -hmm. of overwatch over 50 yeah. percent of all our matches that have ever been played were three zeros this is just yeah. a very one-sided game between like some some teams are just like so much better right then this there's just never been uh a situation where more than half of the league were even co really competitive with the top teams, right? Yeah. So, and then meta swings just favor, like, swing so hard in one direction. Yeah, you could argue that that's a flaw with the game, but yeah, I, I, I think I, you're right. It's more likely to happen in open systems. But given that we're in a tournament format, I, I think the selection will hopefully quickly get us closer, you know, once we're out of the first group stage. But um, yeah, I not too many great matches have been played, other than you know the odd few in the those situations where like there was a seven one team or like a yeah you know a seven zero or whatever, and we had some bangers there, right? Well, definitely, I, I think you're gonna have like those little like hidden gems, but I think vastly the vast majority of the games being broadcast and streamed and maybe even co-streamed are gonna be kind of carried by the broadcaster which kind of points me in that direction is like how if this is a canary out of the coal mine to use that metaphor for example like how does this impact like the greater like viewer experience is this something that's going to have to be a little bit more entertaining from like a co-streaming and maybe even a broadcast perspective I, I think so. And I actually think that's one of the reasons so many people got invested in the team that I was a part of, right? Okay. So yeah. like, because the thing about our team that made it really interesting is we're not super good, right? Like we're not the best, <laughs> sure. like by any means. But what that meant is I would say seven of our nine matches that we played in were very competitive. Like mm -hmm. they like, like one team wasn't like he heavily favored. We ended up finishing like 53rd or something like that in the tournament going six and three. But like, the, the two of the matches we lost, like one, we had an egregious C9. And then the oh, other no. one, we had like an overtime push on Circuit Royale in like the final fight of the entire match. So it's like, there were some really fun matches and people were really invested. And that's what people enjoyed. 
So I was surprised to see not as many streamers doing the same thing. Like mm. I was surprised you didn't see Seagull join a team, or Flash yeah. join a team, like all those kind of guys, because there's a lot of interest from fans. And that's really where I think the main interest should be garnered. Get those fans in there in the Swiss stage where you have your yep. streamers come. And then as it progresses, the games get more competitive. They play at the top level. Then those fans can transition. I think OWCS needs to find a way to incentivize streamers to do that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's content too. Like yeah. having that, you know, story to tell. And it, it, it I don't know, it seems kind of no brainer, but who am I to say? And honestly, like they, they could have absolutely made groups, I think. Like if they just get a couple of pro players on. Um, <laughs> Did, did you know, Custer, that I, I asked, and I think it's quite, quite correct, um, that you were among one of the only former Overwatch League players that didn't make, make it into groups. I think it was you apply, and then actually, you know, uh, the Runaway Boys from Season 2 also didn't make it in. Um, to oh, to the to think well I, the, the thing is I don't think a lot of that in my in our defense for for me and the boomers of Overwatch <laughs> let me defend ourselves uh, I I think I don't think a lot of people were competing like I, like I yeah, think McGravy yeah. was on a team as well oh no actually I think that was for the J three tournament but like I think a lot of the players that um like the uh, XL guys they're just trying they're either trying their hearts out or they're not doing it casually anymore i think yeah. that's the, the big divide that i think we need to like meet with mm. you know in a, in a big way of like people trying but the thing that i was most impressed with as well because i was like oh you know there aren't that many good teams in you know north american overwatch there's a lot of really good collegiate teams yes mm. that just like they have a couple of really good players but more importantly they like scrim a lot they play a lot they've been playing in tier three for a while and they were like they were difficult to deal with and i think that's that was a cool thing is that there were a lot of like unknown teams and players that sort of like made their way up but you know to your original question yeah the boomers you know it's hard out here yes you know the bones start to hurt a little bit more you go on to bed a little bit earlier you know it's just hard to keep up with these 17 year old kids look just well, DJ, just pull the flats man. just like get better duels yeah <laughs> Well, you know, my team's really good. Well, I actually, we actually kind of popped off. It was, uh, it was actually awesome to have like a squad like that. Of, it, it was funny because we have a bunch of like expos, like Emon mm. gone all the way back to selfless. We yeah. had apply from the Valiant days. Car Q though, this was his first tournament he's ever competed in ever. Wow, which that's was surprising. shocking to me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it was a lot of fun, and that's the main thing. Yeah, Hell I yeah. think you like. What was your final score? Six and three. three. Six and three. Yeah. Seven and two. Some some went in, some went out, right? Like yeah. some idea? seven and two went in, yeah. Yeah. Any idea how good your tiebreakers would have been? Uh it would have been okay. Uh we, we ran into um like one issue where the team we played on the first day, and this is an interesting thing. So the team we played on the first day, after we lost them, the next day, their coach came into our team and he was like, yeah, we were really happy we went three. Uh, well, actually, they went two and one because they lost to the Toronto Defiant. But they were like, yeah, we think we can go far, but like three of our players can't play for the next two days. Mm. So I'm like, that would okay. really hurt your tiebreaker if they end up doing poorly for yeah. the rest of the tournament, and they but they beat you at the start. Yeah, um, Our tiebreakers would have been okay. I think one, almost two teams of the teams we lost to make groups uh so daybreak in north america uh okay. yeah in group a that was one of the teams we lost to they're they had a phenomenal ash player who just like destroyed us mm. and what's the other team uh the other team we played was called aardvark uh they were quite good but i think we i think we could have won those two matches obviously you're always going to say that but uh, sure. two of the matches we lost were winnable uh just uh, just some mistakes here and there did it did it kind of like reignite did it feel a little nostalgic going back to like you know fanatic and you know getting back out there and competing i think anyone who's ever played in a full team environment regardless of what rank you are will tell you that's it's just how overwatch should be yeah. played that's why people fell in love with overwatch and that's why people like i miss the good old days it's like yeah you miss the good old days when you had six or five <laughs> friends five stack, playing a hundred percent of the time <laughs> and everyone was trying their heart out right because that's that's how overwatch should be played like even True. if you aren't the best even if you're you're gonna lose just playing with friends communicating competing and feeling like there's actual meaningful impact for like trying and all that kind of yeah. stuff yeah that that it, it makes me feel young again it, it actually brings me back to my youth as much as i'm not that old it, it brings me back to my youth <laughs> It, it, I feel like that's the there is and, and I feel like Riot's kind of doing this and and 
Activision Blizzard has done this with other titles, but I, I there's a part of me that hopes that Overwatch gets its own little like automated tournament series. You know, like I, I mean, think face um, it does that, right? Come right. Yeah, Obviously, think... face it can do that, but it's like, are you going to get a mass amount of people to get off client? Like, if they can yeah. integrate that in the client to be able to like yeah. launch that through the yeah. game, that would be fantastic. But as we all know, adding those extra steps, you're just like. Yeah, alienating well, so many people no, we're, 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 we're lucky we got face it but like <laughs> I, 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 I want to be I mean, like you know, come on man you know we're, we're barely even crawling right now we're not gonna ask for the sun you know it's it's it is far reaching it is like a, a a horizon set goal that's just like man wouldn't it be so cool if like yeah. that's that's it's, the kind of energy for sure 100 percent. it does 100%. feel pretty wild though that like i played warcraft 3 as mm-hmm. like a semi-professional in like I think 2005, four, we had yeah. replays, okay? We had in-game tournament clients. Yes, our esports broadcasts were Winamp streams, right? Like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we had those two features. Valorant doesn't have re- a replay system. <laughs> like, we don't True. have in-game tournaments, you know? Like, I, okay. What is, what is the reason for that? Why don't we have replay systems these days? Because that is an old thing that was always yeah. available. Right? Like, how did we lose it? Is it just too much data these days? Maybe. I and think it comes time. down to how the, the replays actually function, because I think yeah. in games like, um, I think this is how it works in some of the RTS games. The replays are actually the computer replaying the game that you played. So it's actually going through and inputting all of the same. Oh, so it's just data that's an input. I that's think input. So. Yeah. Ah, I believe. So it's 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 how they actually function, and it's not just like a video of the game. It's actually the computer going through and re-inputting everything. So it's, I I would imagine that that's probably at the crux of I, like how replays work. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yes, they they store all the information, but it's also like a a value thing, right? Like now that everyone, sure, yeah. every person's graphics card has like an inbuilt like capture system right mm-hmm. and everyone can make clips dude if i wanted to do that in 2005 i would have to like smash my print screen button you know very quickly yeah. <laughs> to generate <laughs> a- oh god damn it <laughs> create little gifts of everything yeah so like That's replays just- actually had some utility i remember like there were i i actually for a while like i volunteered for a website called replayers.com and one of the things I did was like write little summaries for the best replays of the week. I remember like, you know, Grubby against like Mad yeah. Frog, like look at this crazy strategy. And uh, that like replays used to be a huge thing during that time, right? Now, yeah. mm-hmm. like all of that is just like completely different. Now it needs to be like, you know, uh, like even, even frag movies are dead, to be honest. Like it's all about like little clips, Twitch clips, sharing those. And it's just a path of technology that I think, like it, it the dev time is just spent better spent on making a better game for the most part. Yeah. the The thing that I will say is, what is a little strange is, it cannot be that different than an Observer client, right? Like, it, I think the problem is that like the the companies just say, okay, we don't need to polish as hard for observers as for a consumer product. So we can just tell the observers, like, work around that. If, like, if you do that, that produces a glitch. While for replay clients, you have to tell the programmers, okay, this is a no-go. We don't want, you know, customers to break our client in some way, right? So I, th- I think it's just probably a time value uh, difference from That's back good. in the day, yeah. right? 100%. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I it, mean, it, it, replay I, viewers I mean, don't make money, right? It's, it's skins and it's all those, you know. So it, well, so I, it has to be they, they want yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. And then they don't use it. Yeah, like nope, it, it, it's like everything. It's like the Overwatch, uh, the Overwatch League replay viewer. It's like the oh, kind of thing so where good, everyone's man. like, everyone's like, it's so valuable. And for us, yes, it's yes. our it's our livelihood, right? So it's like matters. There's three of us. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, was, the average not viewer used. says they would love to be able to go check it out, but they don't. Like, and they don't install. Yeah. Like, I would love to have known even when the replay viewer was at its like most functional and working how many people actually ever logged on to use it It, i don't think it would be many so it's like why would the devs put time into it a hundred percent and i to expand on that i wonder how at what at what number or like what price point would 
Blizzard actually have to price that at to create it to make it at least break even, you know, where yeah. it was like, OK, you know, the all access pass back in the day, you know, nobody used it. It was still a paid product. And even then, nobody used it. At, some at what point, point would that kind of even itself, you know, I hope at some point someone comes forward that would involved in that project, because like I heard mm. wild things and how ambitious Twitch was in trying to get like you know, the subscribers and what kind of products sure, they were yeah. planning and whatnot. Like a major part of the value proposition of like the 90 million deal was these paid services, right? Like yeah. Twitch does not have any direct products they monetize other than like Turbo or whatever, right? And that yep. like if, if had that popped off, that would have been major. They would have actually had a product for esports that they could have sold, right? The thing is, they probably had some, you know, like consumer research data where just like people just like non-committally click yes of course i would use this 100 percent. once again <laughs> complete horseshit <laughs> <laughs> like fucking um what's it called uh, uh preference falsification eric can already not like hear me say this anymore but there's a guy that like an economist that uh developed like this concept of um preference falsification like private truth, public lies was the book, which is basically yeah. like everyone fucking lies, right? Like everyone yeah. fucking lies about their consumer behavior. Everyone ha hates Dick Soto. These fuckers get billions of clicks yeah. every day, yeah. okay? <laughs> like they, they, they're giving you actually what, what you want. Like you're all clicking, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, this is just, yeah, uh, unfortunately will forever be the case i think casa you also know like yeah why is there not more analysis yes we like analysis because i'm so bright big brain then actual <laughs> analysis with like fucking big brain discussions about uh thingies yeah i guess i'll take a leak right here or i will tune yeah. out like yeah I, i'm watching i don't know fucking i don't know any like i'm watching xqc instead you know like yeah, well, it's like people people always wonder. It's like, why don't people do like analytical contests or like replay yeah. stuff like I do? It's like because there's kind of an upper limit on how many people are going to watch that. It's it's not scalable in, in a big way. There is a very limited people who want to go back and watch a replay with high level analysis. There's a reason why you know it's like the it's like the argument, and we get in this little circle jerk in competitive Overwatch and top end competitive where people are like. People just don't want to be entertained. They just want to hear the smartest person on the broadcast tell you exactly what's happening on the screen. And the reality is that's not what brings the, the interest. Case, yeah. And that's not the case. That's not what the majority of the viewer that's base wants. That's what us at the upper echelon want. So yeah. I think there's like, a, as you said, the, it's easy to think that what we want, and if you just look at competitive Overwatch, what we want, uh, wouldn't that be good for the game and the competitive Overwatch? At the end of the day, it's, the answer is probably no in the grand scheme of things. And that may change. That's something that we've kind of talked about on the show as, you know, we transition from Overwatch League veteran fans to, you know, whatever the OWCS wants to, you know, morph into and become and cultivate. You know, that could change. That percentage could change. But I think the vast majority of esports fans and just consumers of content digitally are pretty much here to be entertained at some level, whether it's just full on entertainment. I need to like laugh. 100% of the time via Jinxie or XQC or whatever like hot streamers out there right now or get into you know some of the more interesting little you know minor minutia things that you know a game like Overwatch can kind of produce um hopefully you know maybe maybe that changes we'll, also, we'll have to see also like that was one thing that actually pissed me off when Uncoachable talked about it during the Kanba episode not to sh throw shade on any of the British islands but like this take that basically like every season they, uh, uh, brought, the worst broadcaster should be publicly decapitated for the worst casting. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It was yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. do you guys understand that the, like you guys actually do not really have input on what like you want to do with the broadcast. You probably also just look at like consumer data on what they like. They somehow spit out like wholesome content or a, a, like, less elaborate tone is much yeah. better. Like. <clears throat> and it isn't actually about like you know 9k-ing it dude li like let's be honest i am right now watching 9k i do not give a flying shit about his english as long as i can understand it but i also yeah. realize that enjoying 9k might as well be a test for the dsm5 in 
diagnosing <laughs> di neurodivergence, okay? Like, th this is not a regular experience. Most most of it will be vibes and entertainment, right? And it's not, like, yeah. necessarily understanding how something worked that will give you the good hormones, okay? Yep. That's true. Uh, I, I think there's a big thing here to be said as well. It's like, I think there's a lot of people who get frustrated with, uh, you know, and this is something that, it, it's funny because I went through the whole spectrum of this. When I was a yeah. pro player, didn't give a shit about the desk uh, and the casters because no. I had the same thing of, I was like, these guys don't what really the know they what know. they're talking about. They're entertaining, yep. you know, yeah. like I enjoy it and I love those guys, but it it's not for me. They As a pro player, it, their pro product is not built for me. It's and, a mature view. Yeah, and that's it. And it, it, over time I learned, it's like, hey, it's not just about analysis is thing that needs to be an entertainment level and it's about yep. baking that in together that's what makes the best you know broadcast is the best right the reason people watch inside the nba is not because chuck's a hall of famer who just talks right. about the nitty-gritty yeah because he's funny as fuck to listen to right and he's a he's he can do both and i think people don't give enough credit for the overwatch talent that we've come through the spear in a very long time you know you see soey you see mitch they're instantly going and they're crushing it in valorant you yep. know soey yep. uh is doing uh i believe she just won an award for a uh, game hers award yeah. yep. necra also just won a game hers award you might not like them but they are some of the best in the business at what 100%. they do right and i don't think people give them enough love uh and i think it's easy to be like they don't understand the game at the highest level and the minutiae right it's why jake's on the broadcast right just go it, listen to jake yeah, exactly. and ignore the yeah. others and like that's that's if that's the content that you want to consume right yep and i think as you said, I, I think that Uncoachable take, especially when they were talking about, you know, the Hunger Games version of casting is like, it, it's not fair. And once again, no. I can understand their perspective, but the broadcast is not meant for them. These guys are some of the smartest people in the Overwatch competitive space. Don't watch the broadcast. Then. No. <laughs> what, no. what I will say is, I think I still expect that the tone, I understand why you want to keep the tone very PG-12, right? Like, it, not only is Overwatch, you know, accessible to those in terms of like the age limitation, so you can feasibly go to a Disney network and say, oh, our game is accessible for 13 year olds, so we will only use language and like framing that is appropriate. CS is unencumbered, for instance, by that. The game is only accessible yep. at 18, right? Yep. Like, I, I recently saw, like, did you guys see the dust clip where you just like, drops F-bombs live on broadcast, even PGL that are usually, you know, PG in, in terms of, like, how they frame it. Like, they just go all in. Because they can, right? Like, that's their right. demographic. Um, I think the sponsors that they've attracted are fine with that type of tone. It's also yeah. more uh, European uh, esports generally, so, or, like, the sensitivities are different anyway. I will say, I think the, the success of co-streaming kind of shows us that this demographic is also more into that and i wish yeah like i understand that you can't given that your monetization model but i feel like you now have to sort of pivot to a monetization model where it can't just be about sponsors that only want the pg-13 content but that actually like you know want a legitimate representation an authentic representation of what people you know zoomers would be talking about the language that they use gremlin out like crouched on their uh on like feet on their seat basically yeah gremlin moding and talking about video games right i think if that had been more of the tone and ha had that developed into that i i expect that this is probably something that more people liked and I will also say that even f among a hardcore crowd, the way Uncoachable exploded, I think they're way closer to what the core audience wants in terms of tone than anything else, right? Um, I agree. So, like, I, I think we should have... I understand where we couldn't, but that definitely, now that it's an open, open format, I hope that is explored in terms of the tonality of the broadcast and of the discussion. And honestly... I totally see that if that isn't covered, then we will either have established talent outside like you just do dominate in terms of co-streaming because they provide that tone, or we ha will have some cracked out Zoomer that will like, re hopefully, we will find in some way, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jinxie, mm -hmm. he's not necessarily involved in R6 esports, but like he's a competitive player in Rainbow Six, and it seems like that guy by himself revived that interest in that game, right? And I hope we get like someone with that energy 
to bring back it interest and really develop like a co-streaming um culture around it to talk about uh overwatch to make it cool again in some way right because yeah. a, a lot of it fa feels just like it's wholesome but like the, all the vibe you know like think about the the streamers that we had there was so much personality initially here tender tadman even poke right like um like xqc these guys had like character that was some, somehow tied to the brand and i hope like we we can really like find that again and also sh kind of show to to upper level management that that is the tone this game wants to be broadcast in or rather the tone that this audience wants to be entertained because i think that's much more accurate to what kind of entertainment people of the that demographic enjoy I yeah I think that's kind of why co-streaming is valuable because especially when you open it up to anybody uh, is because people can watch the vibe that they want to watch the broadcast with, right? There are some people who want to watch Avast talk about cannibalism while yep, they're yes. in the middle of a match, right? That's, that's you know, he's sort of our different look. And that's the thing about Uncoachable, right? If you want to go watch hard-hitting analysis of them really breaking shit down as it happens, go watch their, uh, go watch their broadcast, right? I know Commander X has been doing scrims recently. Yep. Um, that's not but, the draw, though, right? Like, it's the mudslinging. It's the, yeah. it's the gladiatorial for, for arena of, like, yeah. blood sports. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, that, like, that's Uncoachable's big pull, right? And people got frustrated with them, and I think they actually took a little bit of flack with the recent episodes where it's like, they're trying to... It's the, the Dexodo issue where it's like, everyone says they hate Dexodo, but then everyone goes to the fucking yeah. article and reads it yeah. and then talks about it, yes. right? And yeah. that's what Uncoachable was doing very all, early on with their thing. That's what they said about the casters. That's what they said about, um, you know, the Korean players. Like they were very c critical yeah. of Korean players and like the culture wars that they had within their teams and stuff. And then they sort of clickbait the title because people aren't going to watch it. They're just going to read the title yeah. and then they're going to get mad about it. And that's why people were talking about it. Like you can be mad at them for doing that stuff but at the end of the day it got everyone talking about it and it got you know their opinions out there uh so it's like yeah i don't blame them at all i as i said i don't like towing that line because i you know i like being a good boy on the internet uh and i don't like people <laughs> saying mean things about me so uh i try i try and talk careful line but it, it's entertainment and i think if it gets people talking then you know and there's a part of the internet that wants that look like, that's true i i i even think that you don't have to necessarily go into, you know, the, the Korean stuff and whatever. That, I agree that's a little far. I, we, on this, like, on this podcast, have greatly enjoyed when you in, went in on the Washington Justice back in the day, for instance. Like, Pre you can even, I think you can even attract or, like, seek out that type of dopamine by just telling people their shit, when they're shit, you know? So when it's, I, when I it's like, say... rightfully, you know, you gotta wield it carefully, but it's true. We've gotten in a lot of trouble for doing that in the past. And the reason and the reason I did that, and there was a chance that I was going to get sure, a message from sure. my boss's boss who was going to be like, hey, you can't say that about teams because Washington Justice came to us in a complaint. There have been teams that have complained to us throughout my three years, especially on the desk, primarily on the it, desk yeah. this happens. They, they say, you guys are being too mean to this team. Or like, this team has complained that you guys are talking too negatively about this player or this team. And... That's the things that the fans don't see no. is that sometimes when we have been critical, there was pushback. And that was the issue with the Overwatch League, right? Yeah. So much red tape. The teams have the ability yes. because they're a franchise team to be able to say, hey, this isn't fair. We, you, we don't want this to happen, right? And I'm not going to name names of who those teams are. Washington Justice didn't do that after my rant. But there's a reason why people don't go out on a limb and say yeah. those kind of things. And that's also the reason why... You know, it's the uncoachable idea of like being very critical of teams and players. They're like, I think they're just too soft. I don't think they anal uh, analyze too much. It's like, well, sometimes we were really just held back on yeah. what we were able to say. I, that, I'll, I think like when that happened to Boston, that was actually this, this or season six, that was actually quite admirable how they dealt with it. They yeah. like, at least for a brief period of time, they just took on the, the villain role, villain role. Mm -hmm. and I think like that's the best thing that you can do. I I had hoped that, um, like behind the scenes, eventually folks just realize that like there's there has to be a push and pull. Like it cannot only all everything be positive. You know, there's a a, a system in Germany where you cannot talk negatively about employees in their employee evaluation. Now you know what happened is. There are now code words that developed where, for instance, he did 
uh, he regularly did his duties is a codified word with, for uh, 70% in of the time. Shit. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. You know, it's it, like it just moves upwards, right? Like, and it, it, I feel like there's just su such an arms race where that it just shouldn't have happened. I think like uh, they, this was one of the more damaging cultural issues in the Overwatch League. And yeah, I'll just, I'll, I think like, it, I, I'm not sure if it was the first instance, but I definitely remember ho the whole flame fiasco and whatnot. Um, yeah. Back in the day, uh, to be fair, he, he even went to discuss it. He had a little bit more balls than uh, folks just doing it behind the scenes. But like, I, I think uh, the best a uh, commissioner could have done is just to tell the teams, oh, yeah, yeah, I will talk to my broadcast team and go to the broadcast team, keep doing it. It's, it's getting the numbers, right? And in the end, the owners would have said, oh, I guess we're getting numbers. What do we care, right? Yeah. Um, I think you can absolutely sell a bad boy brand as well. Uh, if anything, like esports currently, if you look at the teams that are doing the, the best or seemingly are doing the headlines, are the G2s, are the Sentinels of the world that have that 50% of them being perceived as arrogant, as like too much, like cocky, whatnot, right? I, I think yep. like the, this, this pressure definitely that's that's one thing that the owners definitely have to take on the nose as as an issue that they had and they facilitated because like in, in the end it is about competition it is not it's it's not just you know like handshake sportsmanship that sells yeah. tickets right it's true it's true and i think that even goes back um even further like looking at like how eg you know in the 2010s how they were marketed you know they didn't have the best players like let's let's be frank they didn't have a ton of great players, but the way that they marketed him was was very successful. I remember um, watching Idra in StarCraft 2 all exactly, the way back in the day. Yeah. I loved watching him. He wasn't the best by any means, but he was entertaining as hell. It was it's so kind of like funny. the Arteezy in Dota 2 yes. as well, right? It's it's just how what using what you have and like really and, and this sounds really cliche, but it's leaning into it just like how Boston did, you know, if they could have, you know, if if in a different universe where they had more resources, maybe, you know, that even goes farther and they have more more of a, a, a marketing presence in that way um XQC but in the, the mobile mvp <laughs> oh, uh, yeah he's at the uh, oh god we oh love we love the magenta club out there the boy howdy i love me some some draft shout outs to miro anyways um costa in the in the final couple moments that we've still got you um i do want to kind of ask you about the the na side of the group stage okay we've got some some big shakeups we've got some big names I'll I'll hit you with the easy question first. Give me like the top two or three teams that you're kind of tapping as like tournament favorites. Obviously, teams like Toronto Defiant, M80, Maryville, some faces that people are going to recognize. Are that is is that possibly the top three, or is there maybe some sneaky teams in there? Um, I think M80 is an interesting one, uh, especially because it's like people look at it and they're like, oh, wow. Well, like obviously Toronto Defiant, they, I think Toronto Defiant yeah. by far the favorites. They have the infrastructure. Okay. They have this pre-existing synergy. They're rank one. And I think you saw that in the Swiss stage. I think they went sure. nine and oh, not even close. I think they played WD40 and like two owed them in like 15 minutes or something like that. Wow. Like, and it wasn't close. But M80 is like, this is a team that came together last second. Mm -hmm. I think you run into a big issue that Pelican and Spectra, one of them's playing on high ping. Uh, so that could be kind of difficult. So like, I think M80 will be a really good team, but you know, this team was put together with duct tape and the seat of their pants because <laughs> sure. like of everything that happened in NA going into it. Uh, and then like, there are some good teams, but for me, I think this is like Toro Define is like so far above everyone else mm, that I don't think okay. it's going to be competitive. If anything, and I've said this on the stream, I actually think the European region has more teams that will be competitive with Toronto Defiant. I think I think NA is very top heavy, while I think mm. Europe has at least like four or five teams that I think are going to be more competitive. And you saw that in the Swiss stage. And that's I think that's the ultimate. I feel like when we talk to some of the fans, the, the the most memorable games are those super close ones. It's not like that high level Overwatch. It's not the the it's it's it was it close. Was it dramatic? Yeah. Did it go all five games? Was there a tiebreaker? You know, that's the stuff that people tend to remember, right? Did anyone um, talk about Toronto Defiant throughout the entire Swiss State Shorter? They went nine and zero, but they booty bopped everyone to the point yeah. that it's like, well, what, what does it even matter at this point, right? Mm -hmm. It's Sorry. it's a sad realization, well, but look, you know. far be it for me to be a Scrimbox warrior when I lie, okay. but Here I watched comes. I watched <laughs> yeah, M80 against uh, Toronto Defiant, and of course, like 
they I don't think like Toronto Define was uh, necessarily trying. But man, Hog was clapping someone's cheeks in the, those scrims that I saw. Like Hog yeah. is currently like doing very well on those heroes. So um I I agree that like there's it's not great with the folks on on ping. And mm. yes, they don't necessarily have to pay uh, play both Koreans, right? Like Hydron is still there. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if they're bringing them over. Um, from what I could gather, like I have an interview that will probably be out by the time you get to hear this podcast. And McGravy said that they, like MAT was one of the best deals around, basically, right? Like, and, and I'm not sure if they're capable of bringing someone like Pelican over. But um, be that as it may, I think that's, yeah, definitely like for me, the second best uh roster i think they just basically when the card house of na fell they just grabbed yeah. the best paid pieces and ran with the yeah. exception of i think hydron over seeker is probably a mistake yeah i agree i i think i think we can all agree i think seeker has potentially a hotter like prospect yeah. and he's he's more lightning in a bottle uh especially because like hydron has been a part of like a lot of those teams that have like fallen short i don't know if that is on hydron like i think hydron's a phenomenal player i think you can make arguments for both but i i think i i agree this m80 team is the team i expect to probably be number two right like i don't sure. wd40 i don't see them consistently saying at number two uh mm. i think this is a good team i think they could be the third na seed that comes through but i would i would assume m80 is going to be uh be number two when it comes to it climbing the ranks some uh some explosive Yes, that was a pun. Um, you know, things possibly happening in an A. Uh, last one for you, Custa, before I get you out of here. Yes, that's my alarm. Forgive me, audio listeners. Um, Beta wise, we were talking prior to the show. You're looking yeah. at Korea. They're doing a lot of doom. Um, skimming through some of the scrims that Commander X had posted um, and maybe some of those those tiebreaker games. We are seeing a little bit more of like a slower kind of like pokey, like Ramatra Sigma stuff on certain maps on certain sides. Um, is that something that you think is going to be very NA centric? Is that something that you think is going to persist? Maybe even going into EU? Like, where do you kind of think about the meta right now? I, I think right now, it, North America is very Junker Queen pilled. Like, so okay. one, one thing's for sure: everyone's going to play Lucio Tracer pretty much everywhere. Everywhere, like that, yeah, that is that will be the staple. So it's what you're building around that. Uh, some teams are playing, uh, as you said. It, I think the Doomfist works very well against the Junker Queen. I think if okay. you play it well and you push the Queen around. The queen just ends up standing around, not able to do anything. So that's why I think in the Asian region, you're seeing more Doomfists is because they have great Doomfist players, right? They're like, they mm. have more consistent great Doomfist players that they can counter. But then you have teams like uh, Falcons who are like, well, we don't want to play Doomfist. We're going to play the Diva counter dive to your Doomfist, right? So they're playing like a dive and counter dive while NA is just like, we run forward as a unit. We zug zug with queen and then we hope for the best. Uh, you're seeing a little bit more diversity in Europe. I feel like like they play Ramatra, they play some queen, they like okay. mix things up. Like Europe is, is kind of all over the place. But the one thing that's coolest in my opinion about the Swiss stage that I played is that I don't think I played against a single team that played the exact same thing. Yes, they are iterations of the same. Everyone's playing Lucio sure. Tracer, but some teams like to play Ash hits again. Some teams like to play Genji. Some teams like to play Echo. Some teams like to play the Ramatra instead of the Queen. So there are little iterations on every single thing. And right now, I don't think there is a, this composition is the best. I remember I watched uh, Toronto Defiant playing and they were playing like something fucking, they were playing Wrecking Ball still at certain points. Oh, okay. so they're just sort of doing whatever, like, it's very up in the air and there is no one composition fits all uh, across the I meta love right that. now. That's so, so good. Any, any thoughts there, Yiska? Um, yeah, I think it, it would be interesting to see how, how metas develop now because yeah. mm. the, the reinforcement mechanism was sort of like everyone has like these enclosed scrim circles and it kind of travels that way, right? And like it, professionalized teams figure out what works and then there's some um argument from authority where like if if you know Dallas Fuel plays it, I guess it's good. Sure. Um, so like I, I think that will be probably be less so the case, especially during all the Swiss stages. Mm. Um and then I, I think even this group stage will see it considerably less but than beforehand. So we will have some some more diversity um based on that there. It will be interesting to see if that holds up uh 
throughout the competition as, as we go into the second group stage and then also into the land finals. And then, not to be underestimated, as we knew from uh, ev evolutionary biology, like the separation of species or of like, you know, co-emergent, um, that's the wrong word, but like basically like different colonies figuring out how to interact with each other, like the separation of ping really lends itself to um, to different matters. And then once we clash there, it also will really depend on what the structure will be during those uh, offline matches. Yeah. Like will teams arrive yeah. early? Will some teams have the ability to boot camp? Um, I think like it's especially considering um, it's like we've seen that Twisted Minds has the, uh, the resources to facilitate that for their team. They, they uh, boot camped in Korea, sure. I think. Yep. Other, I, I assume Falcons has the resources to bring their team over to yep. the US. Um, how, how will that transform the, the meta if they, I don't know, arrive two weeks early? They will probably inform the meta in some, in some heavy way, right? But that's... But we are now once again figuring out what the meta game of the scrim meta will be and how that is not just going to be the sentiment in it. Because I assume like with waning resources, people will just hit the ground, hit the tarmac and start playing in the tournaments for a vast majority of cases. And that actually has a lot of upset potential as well. Yeah. I think even a team like Falcons is not necessarily warded... Like, you can only build up antibodies against certain meta comps if you've been exposed to them, right? Like you might be able to via the better, um, you know, visibility of like scrimbots and everything to mRNA mm -hmm. vaccine your way out of their solutions, but you don't know if that's. I don't. Yeah. I don't believe you at this point. I feel like you have a word bank that Eric or maybe even some of the Discord members have prompted you to try to fit in as many buzzwords uh, look at, to, to look at the it, it's, it's getting out. Yeah. It's it's getting a little too crazy. Custa, we thank you so much for your time. Anything anything you quickly want to plug before we get you out of here? Uh yeah, I watch will be back next stage. Uh it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna be co-streaming a lot of the matches that are going on. I'm excited. Like I agree with Yiska. I think one of the coolest things that will come out of this is uh this happens in League of Legends, this happens in any sort of region. The metas do exist, and when you have less resources and there's not as long a boot boot camps, it just becomes which region's meta or yes. which region's style ends up being the best. It's going to be a rock, paper, scissors. Maybe for all we know, Europe might not have better teams, but when the Koreans come up and play against the European teams, they don't have an answer to them in a yep. short amount of time. So I'm excited for that. I think it provides regional pride, and I think that's what OWCS is all about. It's more, it's not as much World Cup, but it's more, it's like regional cup of the world, and you get to cheer for your region. I'm an NA fan, even though it's a fucking shit show in here. Oh, to the moon, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> base thank you again custom for coming in and chatting for a little bit i know you got to get out of here we're gonna chat a little bit longer um right. but thank you again appreciate thanks, you guys thanks for having thanks me thank on you. and uh, yes. until next time yep. all right um before you go full darwin i do need to support the people who do make us fit and strong and right to possibly make more content and that's battle cry refine being bronze babu help castle welsh and parts amy rock rex zane volumel and sugar high rmd rw brother adam l ice Jello, fireman six and ak Thank you so much. I didn't forget about you. I promise. I, I know Eric put that up on the screen. I'm I'm going to be honest. I have I'm currently having like this phenomenon where like as a wee German lad, I mm -hmm. I used to hear words in like you know Eminem songs or whatever. I didn't actually know how they were spelled, and this is how I feel about those names right now. Like I never really thought about how I M D R W is spelled, or that oh, okay. I thought brother Adam L were one person. This is wild to me. Yeah, no, separate people. Damn. Crazy, huh? Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. Yes, I, I totally agree. I didn't want to completely cut you off, but I, you know, had to get cussed out of here. I do think that, you know, the way that betas are going to develop um, is its own, like, documentary series, right? We went from, at the beginning of the Overwatch League, everybody in LA screaming against each other, everything was the same majority of the time, right? There was very few, like, characteristics from team to team. Everybody was kind of, like, in agreement that this is what's good, and this is, everything else is shit, and don't play it. As we separated into the COVID era, things got a little bit more open. You know, the Asian region had its own bubble. The NA region had its own bubble. 
as we continue to progress, we start to really kind of galvanize and cement the idea that maybe it's about styles. We get teams like London Spitfire getting stronger and stronger and leaning farther into like the Ryan stuff. And we, we do get more of these stylistic teams. Um, I would imagine that that probably continues to evolve the game as we get farther and farther out in, you know, the, the tentacles of, you know, face its little system and the OWCS is attracting more and more open talent. Um, you know, people are coming in with their, their own ideas. They have to figure out how to get to the group stage. So that inherently kind of points you in a direction already where, you know, you can't just play what everybody else is playing because sometimes that just isn't going to work for you. If you have to win a certain number of games to make it out of the Swiss stage, you can't just play what's good if that's just losing you games. So it's already kind of pointing you in the direction, right? That the system is already pointing and shaping the meta. So it's going to be entirely very fascinating to see how this system changes the game in a competitive sense, not like team four, but you know, it's, it is, it is an evolution for sure. I will say what I also realized watching these first person streams is like individual skill will once again shine in these, you know, less yeah. sophisticated yeah. strategical uh, environments. Like, it's not just that even teams that are very coordinated, like um, SS Space Station Gaming are, sure. um, it's like they also now have less well-coordinated pa practice partners, and that will also impact their level in turn, right? Like, as, as the pressure lowers, like, they will improve less. I will say, I had an experience watching Fanny Astro, like, play against um, the... the um, what's, what are they called? The Kefsa team? Um, Let me pull it up. What, whatever, whatever their name is, right? I, it's Ubo like, Spray Tech. Yeah, like I was, I was watching that, and I, I had a feeling when I watched. Do you know the movie Gravity? With Sandra I've Bullock. I've heard of it. I know what you're Sandra talking about. Sandra Bullock but... and George Clooney. Okay, we're yeah. in outer space, and there's a scenario where, and I watched it in IMAX, and Sandra Bullock is in her in her spacesuit, and they she like gets flown or thrown out of the space station and just like flies around disconnected from the space station into outer yeah. space. And I weirdly given that she's now within the physical realm of infinity, right? She's in space. My brain went, Oh my God, claustrophobia. Okay. Watching yeah. Funny Astro get sprinted at by Kevsta gave me that feeling. This boy is fucking crazy with it. Like, it, it's unlike anything else in that region. The pressure that Kevsta is just able to exude by himself. Like, the, the amount of time Sparker was just, like, getting donked on by Kevsta is fucking nuts. This boy yeah. is different. And like, I, I think, like, especially given that most of those freaks have now been locked away in, in Korea, right? Like, yeah. I think, like, that, that will maybe... Kevster, like, you want as many Kevster scrims as you can get if you want to have any chance against Korean squads. Sure, because, of course. like, it feels like nobody else in that region is even remotely... Like, okay, I'm not, like, I'm not talking shit about Twisted Minds. That's, I think that's also fair shout. But, like, it's, like, Overwatch League traces are different. Like, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And, by the way, I'm not sure if North America has one of those. I would be willing to bet that it's going to be very difficult to... Well, okay. I, I, I want to approach this from, from a, to, in a very particular way, because I think you set up something very poignant that I don't know that many, very many people are, like, thinking about actively. With the import restrictions, obviously you can only import so many players, meaning that talent that probably could have floated in the past is now going to look like head and shoulders. So it's going to like inflate a lot of these players that probably have been deserving of like the praise that they've gotten. Obviously, Kevster is a, a generational talent, but it's only going to like further 
his impact because of how little competition he really has. Same thing when it comes to someone. Same like any of those those big talent those big name talents are going to look they're go- literally going to pale in comparison to their peers. It's it's going to be transformational. That being said, when you look at NA, there is yeah there isn't like a ton of like specifically tracer specialists that really leap off the page. I think a lot of people will point probably towards Rocket on Team Timeless. I believe hopefully that's correct i know that roster many has been going on so hopefully liquipedia is correct yep. he was definitely somebody that impressed me in the pro-am and is somebody that you know contenders talent always was pointing towards as you know somebody to kind of keep an eye on um i know that maryville did finish seventh but i do think they they're going to be like fairly competitive when it comes to those top seeded teams i think them versus m80 or define is not necessarily going to just be a complete stomp even though i probably would favor you know former owl talent over you know dante and you know the young guys but it it, there is this i I do think it's important to like really emphasize the fact that you know we are going to see some new names but the names that have existed prior to and probably were like middling in the overwatch league era will probably look insane in comparison to some of the teams out there It, it really is going to be interesting to see how the community reacts to that yeah, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree. I think it's, it's also like it's just an opportunity to get its own, like, yeah, the delusion. If if the separation, and we only have like two or three meeting points I- I- each year, right? Yep. As it can, currently stands, there's something to be said about North Americans and to a lesser extent <laughs> Europeans getting to soak into their, their own delusion that they can fuck with <laughs> the Korean yeah. boys um, but it's also there's also something to be said about you know maybe someone can step up and maybe Tracer yep. isn't the end all be all and someone develops something else um, I mean Rush definitely I think what what Christopher said in, in stating like they have beaten way better teams than that have been currently formed in the OWCS is definitely true, right? Like yeah. they they have some their trophy case in the Overwatch League was fucking incredible, and arguably they've only gotten better with recruiting Astro, right? So yep. it's it's going to be interesting looking forward, um, how how matters develop, and maybe that there, there is something to be said about like other regions just getting to explore their own synchronicities and that actually succeeding if you let it you know bubble in or and cook enough without the pressures of the now and just the now of that particular region where at the end what you cooked over three months of isolation is actually competitive to the other um other region or south korea specifically and keep yeah. in mind they also only to have two slots right so there's even less uh, opportunity for them to just bonk you and the likelihood of, you know, like we already know Europe or NA is going to have two of the semi slot, semi-final slots in Dallas, yep. right? So that's good. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see how, how that develops. It's, it's going to be exciting. I think the artificial separation um, will help, but... The downside, of course, also is that it did force retirements, that it, um, it, it did lower the quality across the board. 100%, yeah. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see uh, how that develops. But yeah, it's, it's, it's now about making an entertainment product first and foremost in order to have any chance in hell mm-hmm. for organizations to come back. And secondly for Blizzard to finally define where the revenue teams are coming from. The yep. nebulous term of like crowdsourcing prize pools during those majors does not help if you don't know how much effort they're putting into these skins, right? Yep. And it's also like, I, I think given those monetization issues, it's probably fair for organizations to ask for a bit 
bigger price pool cut this time around if those crowdsourcing endeavors are really only contributing towards the price pool and not directly to the teams like they would in Valorant, like they would in, um, in CS. And I do hope that the pressure that the other titles are putting on, arguably I think Valorant will set a new record with their, with their capsules uh, coming up. I think there's a, an argument to be made that maybe this major in, in CS will like maybe get close to the 33 million that they got through Paris. We'll see if that gets close. Okay. And then rightfully, even within the marketing team or the sales team, people will say, wait, why does that work in other esports and not in ours? And that's when the incentives are created from a business side to create these products that hopefully um, are a win-win for teams, for players, and for the developers as well. Ideally, that's the case. Hopefully, you know... Th I think you you established the fact that, you know, Overwatch did not have very fertile soil, but had a lot of great farm equipment and had a lot of resources to try to terraform the land to make it into something that maybe it was never really meant to be. However, OWCS is in the complete reverse of that. Not a lot of resources, but the ground itself feels far more tillable, right? you have the inherentness, the inherent drama of going through an open circuit. You have the inherent like tribalism. Once we get to land, you have NA teams, EU teams, Asian teams, everybody gets to root for their representatives, right? That's going to draw viewers. On top of that, you have active crowdfunding that we didn't necessarily have in the past because it was a closed circuit system, right? All of this should point us towards growth. It's just collecting that you know critical mass to kind of spin that up ideally that becomes the case and ideally we get to the that that future where we can be you know the cs generating 33 million um a land you but, know a major what what every like quarter year let's be honest the the resources committed as currently signaled by blizzard are like a gogoplex less than <laughs> Then of what, course, what Blizzard is getting, uh, or more rather than bl what Blizzard is uh, committing to this endeavor, yeah. right? Like, yeah. um, and that if if that esports wants to have a chance in hell is impossible. I, I like during the interview with Adam Adamu that has been mm -hmm. out for a while, but I, I think by the way, criminally unrated interview, probably the best interview that we will get on the future of Overwatch esports. Not many folks watched it, but um, like he basically said. If, by, if eventually there is no partnership agreement between teams in this scene and Blizzard Entertainment, the developers specifically, there's yeah. just nothing to be said, right? Like, nope. it is patently clear now that for this period of esports, there's no monetization or no way out unless the developer realizes, acknowledges, and shows through action that. Esports is a part of the marketing or the PR of that yep. game. It provides that value, and therefore it's only right that incentive structures are set for the teams that are creating content for you and value for you. And companies like Riot Games mostly have acknowledged that. I think that Wealth ran its, its tests. It's maybe less true for Dota, it's definitely mm -hmm. more true for CS uh, based on the numbers that we're seeing. Um, how that happens is whatever, right? Like if it's through skin gambling, blah, blah, blah. Sure. Gambling is part of the esports uh, e system as well, right? Maybe also yeah. critically under uh, served market in Overwatch as well. Yeah, especially also looking at the, um, at the uh, Morgan Stanley report where like that was a significant part of the revenue was around sports betting that never actually realized actualized in, in this especially around fantasy um, they, they never put out a fantasy product that was at all intriguing um, oh. it's yeah I, I think that's the only way forward and it needs to signal this soon or it's dead on arrival 
that's that's what's difficult. We we kind of talked about it in the past that there is such little. We we are seeing, and this is obviously a big piece of news. You know, we are seeing some organizations, you know, become interested. Obviously, M80 is like a relatively small esports organization. They've picked up a team, Space Station Gaming. Again, not a gigantic team, but have put their you know ticket in the hat of the OWCS. We have some Saudi Arabian organizations spinning up and and collecting pe- you know teams. It is. To look at it from well, that business point of view, it is difficult with how early this is, right? But I will say, here's, here's the thing, okay? Mm-hmm. Blizzard has not given any signals. There, there are Agreed. a, f- a yeah. few bolts left in the market. I would say it's only the Toronto Defiant. The rest of the orgs, rightfully, like there, there are endemic esports orgs currently probing the market. And they're going yeah. through these teams and they're say, saying, sell me on Overwatch. The only thing that you can say is maybe it's going to be at the Esports World Cup. Yeah. And that's the selling point. And there's nada after that. Yep. Okay. As it stands now. And I think like in that, it's probably also uh, underappreciating a little bit what organizations bring to the circuit, right? Like um, to, to completely disregard them and hope that the grassroots movement will move the needle is probably just not correct right like there have to be solutions uh that work in tandem and if it's even if it's just like a lot more attention or death hours into esports virtual items that might just be enough assure teams that maybe if you finish x y and z you get like some representation then you get revenue share there and then you can sell it in some way um you know, make that something that works. Like, make it incentive structures that, like, where others have to contribute uh, in some uh, meaningful way and are incentivized to help you promote this, right? As it stands, it, it's, it's just, like, it's basically the esports NFT, okay? You're, <laughs> you're s- trying yeah, to sell yeah. a product on a maybe participation in, in a very controversial system that you're not even sure of will to participate in, yeah. And like you're, you're trying to like read into future gains and buying low, and therefore establishing and hopefully getting to sell high and what. And that's exactly the type of owner that you're now attracting as well. Yeah. You yeah. are, you are attracting <laughs> NFT dumb owners. Money. Okay, like it's not dumb They're money dumbest. necessarily, but it's a gambling money, right? And that yeah. will necessarily also like shape the nature of the culture of this. Right, yeah. and you don't yeah. want to have this fester too much. Otherwise, like th- this culture entrenches, and it 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 will neuroticize the the uh, the scene. Right, agree with people fe- fearing for their jobs, fearing f- to be fucked over by people that rug pull. You know, pull yep. out, do not pay salaries, whatnot. They haven't oh, arrived just yet. Wait, yeah, they're gonna they're they're coming in every sport. If you weren't here during pre Overwatch League, you're gonna experience it this year. Some team somewhere is going to be like, hey, my org didn't pay me this week. What gives? That's it's going to happen. Yeah. When you when you when you talk about partnerships with the developer. You're obviously a little bit closer to the, the ground than 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 I am at these days. At what level do you feel like partnership makes sense for both parties currently? I mean, it, the like, system, not much. The only thing like you basically you, you should not identify orcs that you want it to have you should incentivize sure. like 100 agreed we're on the same track if you win or if you get top yep. three that's yep. when you get that and that and that um it should feel authentic uh and Earned. honestly like at this point for instance um maybe not as the toronto defined but imagine like once the the, the tr- defined consolidate on the one brands right Sure. And then there's incentive for someone like Ibai to show up and have some coy representation in Overwatch. And then Ibai is incentivized to sell that skin within Overwatch, right? Now, mm-hmm. Think of that, right? Then hopefully other organizations that have similar clout want to be part of that system. And considering that the buy-in price into Overwatch is quite currently very low, like I would say, yep. like, it, it's... It's barely livable for most of those guys. 
most of them that are sponsored probably do not have livable salaries. They need to supplement. But keep that in mind. Like, their overhead is not as astronomical in Overwatch right now, right? So, like, it's not the necessarily, like, the price tag that's, that's dissuading people. It's just, like, if, if you have a team of five and maybe a coach that's six people, pay each of them 2K, that's really not much in comparison to other big esports titles. You're probably paying your team less than you would pay your, in the, uh, your individual player in like a League of Legends title or like a, a CS title, right? So it's really about the value that the esports brings. And it cannot, the answer to what, why would I invest in Overwatch cannot just be it gives me points at uh, yeah. the uh, esports World Cup and it might give me a stipend for that particular esports. The answer has to be there's intrinsic value in being in the scene because the developer has signaled that while it doesn't have those assets yet, will eventually lead to a system where it's mutually, mutually beneficial. And you also have to say that as it gets more and more more and more a competitive title, PvE is dead. We are now yeah, moving, yeah. like we're putting a lot of emphasis on competitive play. Competitive play for the first time has become the, the most played title. Hopefully, this is the uh, most played game mode, sorry. Um, hopefully, that is the direction in which we're trending. That is a community that wants esports then. They, that's yep. a community that wants to become better at the game, that will watch player streams, that will watch core streams where people explain how, how this was a good play and whatnot. And that's then a mutually beneficial synergy where an esports makes sense I, I would have hoped that would have happened during the overwatch league already okay we're here now um but that, that's the only way and uh, honestly like we're <sighs> the probability of this ever popping off is probably around 10 percent for me if i had to say yeah as as it stands now it's very difficult to see a future where overwatch is like this this big draw esport can it become that given five or six years hard to tell i think i think there is a lot of like potential and i hate using that word when it comes to overwatch because i feel like for the last five or six years we've always talked about the potential of overwatch um but i feel like it has the the greatest potential to do the most work it just depends on how it's handled um i agree that you know there are you know, when you look at, you know, influencers and you look at streamers and how that can kind of like intersect when it comes to Overwatch or not Overwatch, but like esports players. And as it pertains to Overwatch, um, that can also be a very big draw. But for you, at what like level do you think developer integration or developer partnership would make the most sense? Would it be at like the main event level, meaning that like the top, what, six to eight teams? potentially get integrated into the game with a skin a spray somehow is that something that can be sold to a to an organizer um is it at the land level you know at, at what at what degree do you feel like is best serving these organizers that you're trying to court here's the problem and this is a problem that currently popped off in cs it's currently sure. the case that the rmrs the qualifiers for the major are the most important matches that will be played in the entire cal calendar year. Um, and why is that? It is because everyone who participates, based on um, projection, or rather, like last time you had 33 million, therefore, like the breakdown was like 4.5 million USD per team was accrued through these stickers. The difference, like being the best team and be just participating is not substantial in that regard, right? So you do not want to have an incentive structure where like just getting in, the participation medal is golden. That's what, not what you want, right? Yeah. So there has to be a more feasible system where like the, the, there's still incentive, but the fall off and the hurdles and the thresholds cannot be this drastic. It has to be disseminated in some way um, and that can be just being br broken down into smaller bits and disseminated over, you know, all the prize pools, even at the regional level. Um, mm -hmm. But really, like, I think just giving 
some assurances down the line and some I'm not sure like I'm not a huge fan of partnership agreements is the problem that promotes pro complacency but sure some... it doesn't have to yeah it doesn't have to be partnership agreements but at some level when do organizations either interface or interact or are actively supported by the developer is it like top four at a main event is it strictly at land like where do you feel like the best like I mean, the golden ratio is i think it, it depends on the scale because like realistically if you break it down and like uh okay you you make you you make playoffs in na and you get 15 bucks yeah you're financially supported but yeah it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter therefore like you want to top load but as as funding increases I think like the breakdown it gets more feasible where you can share more significant, even on a regional level, um, where it actually puts a dent into it and where uh, it does subsidize the, the place or the lifestyle or the living that players can make. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, I think... I think it, probably the best way, and it's, it's going to suck because that... So, sort of feels like taxing but if you had revenue share the developer gets some the team of that skin gets some and then a fraction of that goes into the wider system and subsidizes that and even those that just participate get some in order to be able to attack those top dogs i think that's probably the best that you can do i'm not sure at which level that should um should grip I think realistically, look, here's, here's, I'll, I'll tag this on at the end of, of this broadcast because, mm, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. the real ones will, will listen here, but it's fucking patently absurd what kind of oppositions we've had to, to sponsors. And there's no moral argument to be made that we shed on gambling sponsors, we shed on NFT sponsors, we shed on crypto sponsors, and now we, like, the, the proportionality of like that money coming from Saudi Arabia, I just don't see it. There's something very yeah. weird. Like we, we cried all the way into something that I think most people would say is objectively morally worse. And now not only are we silent, but um, we, we just like repelled, especially in the case of gambling, where like there are, there are gambling institutions and licenses that really like do a lot in order to protect minors, in order to protect, um, you know, gambling addicts and in, in terms of like, you know, not, not having too much invested in each bet, only uh, um, accepting box bets. It was just called gambling. It was thrown out, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's, that invited arguably morally worse uh, fun or like sponsors into this circle and there's not a proportional response to this so nope. like that's that would be another thing where we just open it up more to and in incentivize match gambling in some way incentivize fantasy leagues in some way allow yeah. this allow this for like choose well for sure in terms of what kind of sponsors or gambling sponsors you let in but surely that has to be the lesser evil. And I will disclose here, of course, like I, I work for a company called GG Recon that uh, is owned by Bad Fred, so they get, receive my bias, right? Um, but yeah, I think that's a way lesser evil and how all uh, sports run, and it's a, a significant part of the monetization uh, ecosystem in, in, in those other sports. And it's, it's wild that we ran those guys out of town, and now we're here. You know, so like yeah. the other other thing would be allow more sponsors sponsors because looking at those, it's once again rather restricted uh, in in what is possible. Yeah. Yep. It's. I mean, we we did our rule book breakdown. You can go back. I think a couple, three or four episodes. Um, we went through those that that list, and there's not a ton of wiggle room. It's it's still to this day so comical to me that the Overwatch League had the sponsors that they had, but also the sponsors that they had, if that makes any sense. You know, like, in what world is TeamSpeak A, used, and B, is it, what? Why? 
I get it. You got to get some money, but like, yeah. it's just so bizarre. The, the official the is, VoIP, you know, it it just never really worked. I think it's really important to also acknowledge that big sponsor doesn't necessarily mean big money. Like there are That's absolutely uh, sponsorships in esports where I'm just throwing out a name, but like the size of Coca Cola that you get on as a sponsor, and their value they bring is. You have got a huge brand as a sponsor, but the actual yeah, yeah, cool. financial commitment is actually not even big at all. Maybe they're doing it I for mean, you're getting in for free and therefore attracting other sponsors that will pay big because yeah. oh, Coca Cola is interested, right? Was that, that is not kind of the ploy of like Bobby Kotick? Was that not like kind of the the big rumor? Is that because he was also on the board of Coca Cola that he could like just swing that and I, try to? I don't recall how that in? worked, and I'm not sure like if that's even the case. But I'm just talking like from, from like, roughly speaking, even in sure. esports I, organizations. I think that's also fair. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm not talking particularly, but like patterns that we observe in esports. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's at the end of the day, it is about like the economic bottom line that makes this sustainable, right? But yeah, yep. it's it's the optics of it do not clearly tell the uh economics yeah agreed agreed and that's that's it, that that adds a lot of context as to why you're not seeing a ton of org step in as Yiska is like very clearly laid out there's not a lot to bite for an org in overwatch today Will that change with more information coming out as we get closer to lands, as we get deeper into the actual group stages and not the qualifiers? Possibly. It's something that I fully expected that teams are going to be, you know, kind of slow rolled by a lot of these orgs until something actually manifests, something tangible can be gained for these organizations and not just hope to like flip them for the esports world cup, which like you're rightly pointing out is kind of the, the big like fun thing to get to right now you gotta get some money as maybe unethical or ethically challenging as it is it's tough it's tough and i think you're again inherently and truthfully pointing towards the right direction when it comes to any kind of like interfacing from teams and developers that has to exist um because we can't just rely on the players and we also don't know how much value like big players these days really, really bring. Right. I think it is the one thing that teams and players can kind of cultivate and um, challenge on their own is building up their own brands, growing their social media presence and trying to leverage that into, you know, maybe getting an organization. It's possible. Right. I think that's the one thing that you have control over. Um, the rest of it kind of falls in Blizzard's lap. So we will have to wait and see what uh what kind of uh, packages they they want to ship to ship at us um future of owcs that that is kind of the i i agree it has to be sooner rather than later but it's just it seems hard to foresee the layoffs with how quickly this is spin up how like you you mentioned at the top of the hour not a lot of communication coming out for a lot of these teams i would hope that they have some kind of info to work with but it doesn't feel like it feels feels a little rough but such as overwatch right it's not our not our first rodeo we've gone through some some little rough patches and there's usually some good news relatively coming soon uh that being said do want to get you out of here anything coming down the pipeline yeah i think at the time of uh of this being published i will have put out the mcgravy interview um, nope. I'll also have some editorial side. I looked into it a little bit further, explaining the timeline of um, of the bonanza that we had shortly before the um, deadline, roster deadline in NA. Yep. Like collapsing. Um, us around a little bit how that went, and yeah, then uh, there's there's still a a video that is yet to publish. I think it's coming out next week on. Um, potential new retirement waves that we might see based on the patterns I observed and why okay. we have seen retirements. And yeah, that's, that's so far. Very, very good. I believe I'm going to try to go see the new, the, the new Dune movie. Oh, yeah. I watched the first well. one last night. Very, very fun. 
Did you like it? I, uh, yeah, no, it was super, super good. Um, I, you know me and how I consume my content. I did go through quite a few video essays diving into the Dune series quite a bit. So I primed myself. Um, I also saw a lot of like headlines talking about how uh, Villeneuve is very like opposed to dialogue which i thought was like a very interesting thing to try to like spot like throughout the movie where it's just like yeah i feel like a lot of like marvel movies or a lot of like mainstream like hollywood blockbusters or like there's a lot of like exposition here there's a lot of talking here and there just isn't there's no like there's not there's very few like big speeches and like it's it's very particular on when it is talking to you and when it's showing you a lot of things um it is a little confusing I can see how it's very confusing for some people who aren't necessarily super primed or like know the source material. And it kind of is confusing because it doesn't do a lot of exposition. So it 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 is kind of it doesn't hold your hand at all. I think that's the one big thing that I kind of took away from it where it's like trying to view it without any kind of context. It is it's it is like on the surface level very clear, but I think some things kind of get lost in the ambiguity of certain you know goings on so without getting into the nitty gritty but i do want to see that i am working on a uh, a long form piece um been hitting the pavement a little bit actually doing a little bit of journalism i know it's crazy um talk to a couple real-time strategy developers um oh, nice. going through yeah going through um their their games kind of trying to highlight them but also exploring the the rebirth of that genre it feels like there's I'm stumbling across new titles day after day that are um, either going into early access within the coming months or so years. Um, and, you know, it's 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 actually really, really cool to see that uh, genre of video game actually getting some kind of uh, development pressure um, in, in the wake of Blizzard kind of um, being very lackadaisical in that way. So thought that was very fun. That was very selfish of me. And yeah, doing a little bit of that. Nice. It's my own little little project anyone i would know through. that you talked to um eh, not really um the games maybe um i spoke to a developer um i I've, i'll tell you after the show on one of them because I, I thought it was very funny on how i stumbled across it um but i spoke to one of the team members at um sunspear games who were developing immortal gates of pyre mm -hmm. i don't know if you caught that nice um that was really cool. Got some insight there. Um, they they had some very interesting things to say about Blizzard, which I thought was fun. Um, and yeah, just kind of pick their brains a little bit. Why they think RTSs are back on the market. Yada, yada, yada. So you didn't so talk forth. to David Kim? No, not David Kim. That would be very funny. Um, I know there's a... <laughs> There's a there's a part of me that would love to to pick his brain on some things. But no, I did not speak to the legendary... Mr. Kim, likely. Oh. I I would always love to ask why why patch why why patch Zergs why why did you do that to my race? I mean, they were pretty good for a long time. Were you one of the infested cheeses? Be honest. No, 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 no. Oh, come on! You think my games ever lasted long enough to get to infestors? That's even worse. That's actually worse. exactly maybe. We play fast. We play quick. No, actually, yeah, no, I think. Infester players are more honorable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> For sure. Let's abuse the broken things and not just, you know, fight in the honorable boxing arena that is a phone booth, you know? I love a phone booth RTS, okay? Let's just let's just skip all the bullshit. You make your units, I what make do you my units. Bullshit. <laughs> Let, bullshit there's just, is, is... There's, Bull bullshit is dropping in my base and creating force fields around your units and I can't actually interface with them. That's bullshit. I want to just, let's just fight. Let's just stand in the middle of the ring, two men in an ar arena, and let's just see who dies first. Yeah, at 200 population, <laughs> while the macro is rolling, correct, at six bases. <sighs> two very different people. <laughs> All right, that being said, 335, not 355, we're not that far in the future. We're calling it. A, we're calling it quits. We'll see you next week with more OWCS drama news, clickbait. Like and subscribe. Peace.